Grace Bible Church. We are happy to have you with us today. If this is your first time joining us, whether online or in person, we want to invite you to go to gracebible.online and find out more about this church, uh, more about why we exist, more about uh, our leadership, etc. Grace Bible, not, not uh, gracebible.com, but gracebible.online. That's a little weird, but it's kind of memorable. Also, you can go to our Facebook page at Grace Bible Church NC. If you don't put the NC on the end, there are other Grace Bible Churches in America that you will be taken to. So Grace Bible Church NC uh, on Facebook. And there's always some thought-stimulating posts there. Uh, also, Thursday, ladies are studying through the book of Romans. Sandra English is teaching that. Not this Thursday, she says. On most Thursdays, but not this Thursday. I suppose Thanksgiving, right? Okay. Not this Thursday. All other Thursdays, the ladies are going through the Book of Romans. That's an online study, and if you want to participate in that, talk to Sandra. Uh, on Wednesday night, not this Wednesday night, but on most Wednesday nights, the men meet for uh, sermon review and prayer at the East Silva Shopping Center. So think about joining us for that. That's a good time uh, for you guys who have questions about the sermon on Sunday, to bring those with you on Wednesday and ask, why did you say this? I've never heard this before. How do you come to this conclusion, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So we would encourage you to take part in that. Our call to worship this morning is from Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says this. <coughs> Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning thanking you so much that we are able to meet and worship Christ. Uh, Father, I've heard from friends this week who are pastors in Canada uh, who cannot meet with their churches. They cannot have non-family members in their house. They cannot go to the store and buy groceries. And so, Lord, we just want to praise you for the freedom to worship you today. And we know that uh, the time for that may be very limited for us. And so we want to worship you with great joy, with great exuberance, with great thanksgiving, and with great love for Christ and for one another. Uh, Lord, we've been given so much in our country that so many times uh, we come on Sunday morning and are groggy and not particularly excited and not particularly thankful because we do not know how much we have and how good you've been to us. But we want to praise you for this time to uh, sing praise to you, this time to be with other believers, this time to look at the Word of God. And we want to pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted. Thank you that in these last days you have spoken to us, uh, not through a prophet, uh, not through uh, an angel, but through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the heir of all things, through whom you created the world. Uh, we praise you for Jesus Christ. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, upholds the entire universe by the word of his power right now. Uh, thank you that our souls are in his almighty hands. Uh, please impress these great truths on our heart as we sing. And Lord, let the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this for the glory of Christ. Amen. You can stand. Hopefully you have a purple folder that you would have got back there in the foyer. If you do not have one, feel free to slip back and grab one now. That, uh, that folder has the song in there. Yeah, just go ahead. You're not going to bother anybody. Walk back and get some. It's right back here in the foyer. If you didn't come back, uh, come in through this door, you might have missed it. Uh, first song is Holy, Holy, Holy.
18 through 23. And uh, before I read that, I've got something else I'm going to read here. Uh, Isaiah. And this is a prophecy from Isaiah about the coming of our Savior, Jesus. I want to read this. 61, Isaiah. It's, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by and, you know, Jesus did so many miracles throughout his walk here on earth and his ministry. And they were done, you know, for us to believe in him. And this was prophecy. And the thing about, uh, of all the miracles he did, what I suppose the greatest miracle he did was that he, he made a way for us to be saved. listen to a sermon about it, so I sit around and one of the things I didn't realize is that the, uh, the thing about uh, doubt, you know, we all struggle with doubt, but I, I never was taught before that uh, doubt is a problem that believers have. It's, it's a problem we all struggle with at times. And I can think back through my Christian life of times when, you know, a, mir a miraculous thing had happened thing that I, I knew it was from God. It had to have been or, or things, uh, you know, were like, like, for instance, you could be in a car wreck or any kind of thing that you've had happen in your life. And, you know, God proves himself to us through his son, Jesus. And I know he's proved, proved himself to me many times. And yet still, struggle with doubt. You know, these apostles, you know, disciples, they walked with Jesus. And they still doubt it. They all doubt it. They believe in saw him, you know, raise people from the dead. They even saw him heal from the dead. And they saw him, you know, walk again. And they still doubt, doubt him and deny him. But it's a thing we need to pray about. And we want to uh, look at the miraculous works that Jesus did in this sermon today. And uh, let's pray together. Um, God, we just ask that you use Brent and look for your glory today. And Lord, just bring us a message that we grow closer to you and learn more about you and learn more about what you've done for us and this price that you paid and even in difficult times we know that uh, you're still in control and you still love us and you made a way and even at times when we've doubted and we doubt this uh, just every day and we deny you in front of other people and we sin and we go on and we turn our backs on you but God just help us grow closer to you Help us to acknowledge our weaknesses and seek to find our, our own sins, our own weaknesses. Help us to mature. Help us to continue to grow in our knowledge of you and in our spiritual growth. God, just help us to uh, grow closer to you each day. We pray you use this time for that and just bless our time here. We just thank you, Lord. Amen. Stand with me again. We have another song called He Will Hold Me Fast. Uh, we mentioned this song in the sermon last Sunday. So 
Uh, what is your hope for making it to heaven? Uh, I, I hope that your hope for making it to heaven is not the hold that you have on Christ. <laughs> I hope that it is the hold that he has on you. Our text today, uh, Jesus says, uh, I, I give my sheep eternal life and nobody can snatch them out of my hand. Think about that as you sing this song. He will hold me fast.
Spirit carried men along as they put these words on paper in such a way that they put down the exact words that you, God, would have them put down. And we want to take a look at these words. We want to see what you would say to us through the scriptures today. And we want to receive these truths into our heart. Uh, Father, my hope is, as I preach is this, that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose that you sent it for. And so we pray to that end. Uh, we thank you that you have us going through the Gospel of John now. You have us in John 10, 22 to 42 this morning. You have these people here now, and you have work to accomplish by ordaining that all these things would be so today. And we pray that every good purpose you have for us in this text uh, would be accomplished. We pray that those who do not know you, uh, whether here or watching online, Lord, that you would save them today, that they will come to Jesus Christ as their God and Savior uh, Father, I'm not able to do this, and no man is able to do this, but you're able to bring people to life through the living and abiding Word of God. So do that today. For those of us who do know you, would you give us a greater confidence in this Christ who has saved us? Would you give us a greater confidence in his uh, almighty power, his all-knowing wisdom, and the fact that he is with us always? Our lives are in the hands of God because they are in the hands of Christ. And we need to know that uh, in these times that are anxious and fearful and tumultuous. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know what next year will bring. Uh, but Christ is on his throne today. And we are in him and he is in us. And he's going to bring us through. We want to know that today. We want to be happy in knowing that our God, Jesus Christ, uh, has saved us, is saving us, will save us. Father, I pray... Uh, for myself, that you would help me to speak as one speaking the very words of God, uh, that you would get my mind off me and up toward Jesus, that I would preach for the glory of Jesus, and that I would preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, keep me from the fear of man, keep me from proud thoughts, uh, keep me from anything uh, that would be displeasing to you. Uh, forgive me of all my sins, because they are many. Uh, Lord, I can't even breathe without sinning, but thank you that Jesus has paid for my every sin and that I am dearly loved in and through him. 
Uh, we praise you for the gospel and ask that it will be clear. And pray, God, that you will continue to build your church here because you are worthy of praise and honor and glory. You are worthy of the truth being told about you. And you're worthy of God-centered worship. And so we pray that you would bring these things to pass. Even as we look at John 10 today, we ask this for the glory of Christ. Amen. Hopefully you found your way to John 10, 22. <clears throat> we'll go to the end of the chapter. John 10, 22 says this. And we're dropping back uh, five or six verses into the text that we finished with last week. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know. And understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. Now, last week we saw that Jesus was in Jerusalem teaching about how he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And the good shepherd discourse is the last interaction that the Apostle John records for us uh, while Jesus is at the Feast of Booths. So Jesus has been at the Feast of Booths in chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and all the way up to chapter 10 and verse 22. But now the scene changes. He is at the Feast of Dedication. You see that verse 22? At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place. So the Feast of Dedication is Hanukkah. And so when we get to verse 22, in between verse 21 and 22, about two and a half months, we fast forward. Okay? It's now no longer October. It is December. And Jesus uh, is there outside in the colonnade of Solomon teaching at Hanukkah or Feast of Dedication. And at this Feast of Dedication, the main things that, that the Jews are pressing for is a plain confession from Jesus about his true identity. Do you see this in verse 24? Look with me. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. They're pressing Jesus. They're pressuring him. Tell us who you are, Jesus. And why do they want to know? Because they want to fall down and worship him? Because they're interested in knowing the truth? They're being changed by the truth? No, because they want to find grounds to kill him. They've been trying to kill him since the beginning of chapter 5, and so they press him. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Tell us who you are, Jesus. And so that is the pressing question throughout this entire passage. What is Jesus' true identity? This is a question that the world really struggles to answer. 
Not because it's obscure, not because it's hard to figure out, not because the Bible isn't plain about it, but because people really don't want to know the truth. The cults portray Jesus as an angelic being. That's what the Jehovah's and the Mormons and other Christian cults uh, say about Jesus. He, he's an angelic being. He's the first of God's created beings. Secular people portray Jesus as a mythological creature from Christian fairy tales. Liberal churches portray Jesus as the great moral teacher who has come to show us how to be nice to each other and fight for social justice so we can be saved by our own good works. Even Muslims have their own idea about Jesus. They believe he was one of the prophets, but nothing more than a prophet. But what does Jesus say about himself? What does Jesus say is his true identity? The first answer to that question that we see in this text is uh, Jesus giving us the evidence for his identity. Immediately, Jesus begins to, uh, begins to answer the question of the religious authorities when they say, tell us plainly who you are. Jesus begins to give evidence. Look at verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. In other words, Jesus says, you want to know who I am? Watch what I do. Look at what I've done, and you will be able to ascertain my true identity. He says, my works are the unmistakable proof of who I am. My works bear witness about me. They testify about me. Three times in this passage, Jesus calls attention to a unique feature of his works. Look at verse 25, the end of it. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Look at verse 32. I have shown you many good works from the Father. Look at verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. Jesus calls attention to his works as the evidence for who he is, and then he says something about his works over and over and over again. He says, my works are from the Father, done in the Father's name, and they're the works that the Father does. Jesus is telling these Jewish authorities they've already received a plain answer to their question as to whether or not he is the Christ. He says, my works are the works that only God can do, and they are the unmistakable evidence for who I am. Now, what works has Jesus already done in John's gospel that show forth and manifest his true identity? If you remember back, uh, probably uh, four or five months ago, at a wedding in Cana, do you remember what Jesus did? They ran out of wine there. And so Jesus turned 150 gallons of water into the best wine on planet Earth. Uh, if you're going to get good wine, you need to ferment the stuff for many years. And if you're going to get the best wine on the planet, you may need to age it for 80 or 90 years. But Jesus made the best wine on the Earth, 150 gallons of it, just like that. If you remember chapter 4, when Jesus was in Galilee, there was a certain royal official from Capernaum whose son was sick. And his son was sick unto the point of death. And he heard that Jesus was a couple towns over there in Galilee. And so this royal official went to Galilee and he said, Jesus, come and heal my son. He's at the point of death. And Jesus said, go, your son will live. And from 17 miles away, Jesus healed this boy who was at the point of death with a word. He said, my works that I do in my Father's name, that are from the Father, they bear witness about me. In chapter 5 of John's Gospel, at the pool of Bethesda, there was a man. Do you remember him? He had been lame for 38 years. Jesus said this to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. A man who had been lame for 38 years stood up, and he grabbed his pallet, and he walked. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Do you remember in chapter 6, Jesus is out in the Galilean countryside. He's become very popular as a miracle worker. 
And so there he is, and there are over 10,000 people there thronging around Jesus, wanting to listen to, uh, to him, wanting him to heal them of their diseases, etc. And it starts to get dark, and there's no food. And so Jesus takes a little boy's lunch, and he makes food for 10,000 plus people in the middle of nowhere. There were not 10,000 lunches, and then there were 10,000 lunches created from nothing. And then he sent his disciples there in John 6 over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee after he made all these lunches. He realized these people are going to take me by force and try to make me king. And he told his disciples, you guys need to get out of here. And he withdrew up to the mountain. And his disciples started rowing across the Sea of Galilee. And they got about half or two-thirds of the way across. A storm blew up. They were buffeted by the storm. They were rowing against the wind. And so what did Jesus do? Jesus walked on the top of the water four miles on the surface of the water and got in the boat with him and brought them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. In the previous chapter here in John 9, while in Jerusalem, Jesus gave sight to a man who had been blind from birth. Do you remember this a couple weeks ago? The man had been born without sight, lived his entire life in a state of blindness, and Jesus made this blind man see. We read these stories in the Bible. Where, oh, Jesus made a blind man see. Jesus made a blind man see. In the next chapter, John chapter 10, Jesus is going to go to a tomb that contains a dead man named Lazarus. Lazarus has been dead, not for four minutes or four hours, but four days. And Jesus goes up to the tomb, and his friends say, uh, you might not want to do that because he's probably rotting and his flesh is stinking now. You, you, you might not want to open the tomb. Jesus is going to call a man named Lazarus who has been dead for four days out of the tomb. And when Jesus says to come out, this dead man is going to walk out of the grave alive. And of course, before it's all said and done, Jesus is going to do his mightiest work of all. He will be crucified. He will die. He will be buried in a stone tomb. And after three days, he will walk out of the grave by his own power. This is what Jesus is telling the religious authorities. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. You want to know who I am? Look at what I do. My works testify about my true identity. Look at John 17 and 18. Jesus said, I lay down my life. John 10, 17 and 18. I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. In other words, Jesus says, I have authority over life and death. I hold the keys of the grave and of hell and of heaven. My resurrection proves it. Have any of you ever heard of the duck test? The duck test. The duck test goes like this. If it looks like a duck, and it swims like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, then it is a, it is a duck. The duck test implies that you can look at somebody and observe their habitual behavior and determine what that somebody or something is. If it looks, swims, and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. If over and over again somebody does what only God can do, they must be God. So what is Jesus' true identity? Uh, the first thing that Jesus puts out there for us is the evidence. His works. He does what only God can do. Then he makes claims about himself. Secondly, the claim that Jesus makes about his identity. Look at verse 30, and you'll see this claim. I and the Father are one. Now, God is the foundation, the ground, and the basis of all reality. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. This is a staggering claim about the nature of reality. A massive statement about who God is. So what does Jesus mean when he says, I and the Father are one? Okay, so 
So you really need to think about what that adjective one means. Now, in the Greek language, every noun and every adjective has a gender. It can either be masculine, feminine, or neuter. So this adjective one is not masculine. If it were masculine one, Jesus would have been saying, I and the Father are the same person. But this adjective one is neuter. So Jesus is saying, I and the Father are the same thing. What do you mean the same thing? I mean the Father is divine. And Jesus is divine. They're the same thing. They're both God. They're of the same essence. I and the Father are one. So Jesus and the Father are not the same person, but they're both divine. Jesus illustrates this point in verse 27 through 29. Look with me. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and nobody will snatch them out of my Father's hand. Why, why will we not be snatched out of Jesus' hand? Because he holds us with the power of God. Why will we not be snatched out of the Father's hand? Because the Father holds us with the power of God. I and the Father are one. We're both divine. We're both God Almighty. The Father is God. Jesus is God. They're of the same nature, the same essence, equal in power and glory, but they are not the same person. So no, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but it is taught in many places, and verse 30 is one such place. Look at verse 30 again. I and the Father are one. This is a clear claim to deity, and the Jews understand it as such. Look at verse 32 through 33. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. So our Christian cults can't figure it out. Our liberal churches can't figure out who Jesus is. But these people that hated him and wanted to kill him got the picture loud and clear. You, being a man, make yourself to be God. They understood Jesus' claim loud and clear. And so there is a good bit of irony right here. You, being a man, make yourself God. What's the irony? The irony is this. Jesus, being God, made himself a man. They have it totally backwards. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now we get to the hard to understand part of this passage in verses 34 through 46. Look at that with me, please. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, This is not written in your law. I say you are God's. Now, he's quoting Psalm 86, 2 right there. This is not written in your law. I say you are God's. If he called them God's, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world? You are blasphemed because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, this is hard to explain. I'm going to try to make it simple. But to say the least, Jesus is in a dicey situation here. Uh, these men are gathered around Jesus, and they're not smiling. They have large rocks in their hands, and they want to cave his head in. They want to kill him. And so Jesus needs to stop this from happening because it's not his hour yet. He needs to act and act fast, and so he stalls by asking them about Psalm 82, 6. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? And so basically what's going on in Psalm 82 is that human judges are being called little g gods because they have delegated authority from God to judge. And Jesus is saying, 
uh, since Scripture called the judges in ancient Israel who had God-delegated authority little g-gods, certainly it's not blasphemy for me to call myself God because the Father consecrated me and sent me into the world. And Jesus is really not trying to make any grand points here. He's just trying to stay alive, I think. He's trying... Uh, well, he's not trying. He's succeeding in keeping himself alive. He's diffusing this explosive situation by distracting these Jews from their murderous intentions. So, the works, the works of Jesus testify to the simple fact that he is God. His own words make the claim to deity. Look again there at the end of verse 36. I said, I am the Son of God. God. So his words and his works testify to this simple fact. I and the Father are one. Now Christianity is unique because Christians do not worship a pantheon of gods. We also do not worship a single person God. We worship the triune God. The Bible teaches that the second person of the Trinity came down from heaven, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and died to bear the penalty for our sins in order to save us from everlasting damnation. This is what the Bible teaches. Our Savior is no mere man, brothers and sisters. He is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, very God of very God. So, what difference does it make to you and I today that Jesus Christ is not a fairy tale character or a mere prophet, or a good moral teacher, or a great philosopher, but he is very God, a very God. Well, the fact that Jesus is God means that if you want to know what God is like, you don't have to speculate. You don't have to go to a seance. You don't have to go to the meditation center in Silva and read tarot cards. You look at the life of Jesus, and you see what God is is like. John 1.18 says this, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Jesus has made God known to us. Alexander McLaren says, His revelation is no mere revelation by words. Plenty of men have talked about God and said noble and true and blessed things about him. It is one thing to speak about God in words. It's another thing to show us God in action and in life. Look at the life of Jesus in the pages of Scripture and you will see what God is like. Church, since Jesus is God, we can be sure that our sins are forgiven. If Jesus were not God, we could not be sure that our sins are forgiven. There's no way that a mere human could bear and satisfy the wrath of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of every person who would ever believe in him. How could a man do that? The answer is a man couldn't do that. Only a God-man could do that because the wrath of an infinitely holy God is an infinite wrath. And only a sacrifice of infinite value will satisfy the infinite wrath of God. Jesus had to be God and give a sacrifice of infinite value to save us from the infinite horrors of everlasting hell. And he has done that. Since Jesus is God, we can completely rely on all his promises. Only God can make the kind of promises that Jesus makes and keep them. Keep them all, because as God Almighty, he has the power to make good on all his promises. Look at verses 27 28 again. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. How can you know, brother, how can you know, sister, that you will never perish if you trust in Christ? How can you know that nothing, nobody, nowhere will ever snatch you out of Christ's hand? Because when you're held by the hand of Jesus, you're held with the almighty power of God. Since Jesus is God, his teaching is the very word of God. 
His words are authoritative. They're perfectly true without any admixture of error. As God, Jesus knows everything. He sees everything. It is not possible that he could say or teach something that would be wrong because he knows everything about everything and everybody everywhere all the time. You can bank on the truth of all that he says and all that he teaches. As God, his teaching has the authority to govern our lives. As God, Jesus has the right to demand your faith and to demand your obedience. Those who reject and ignore the teaching of Jesus do so at the expense of their own soul because Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. He's come down from heaven to show us what God is like. He has made a sacrifice of infinite value to save all who will trust in him. All his promises are ironclad. All his words are authoritative and true. Do you believe that today? Are you living like that is true? As God, Jesus is worthy of worship. He is worthy of adoration. He is worthy of our very lives. No one is more valuable, more glorious, more worthy than Jesus. And as we think about these things, we should fall down on our knees with Thomas and we should say, My Lord and my God, have you thought about what it means that Jesus Christ is God? Well, the big question through this passage is what is Jesus' true identity? We've seen the evidence for his identity. We've seen the claims that he makes about his own identity. And finally, we see the challenge of his identity. The challenge of his identity. Look at verse 37 and 38. He says, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe in me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe in me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Now, a man claiming to be God is the greatest sham, the greatest boast, the greatest act of hubris imaginable, unless, of course, it is true. Unless that man can back it up with his actions. And that's what Jesus again appeals to. My works, my actions. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then just pay no attention to my claim to be God. But if I'm doing what only God can do, you better sit up and listen. And this establishes for us a very sound principle, doesn't it? We should not judge a person's claims until we see what he or she can do. For anyone who actually wants to know the truth, Jesus has provided more than enough evidence to back up his claim to be God. The works that Jesus did were simply beyond the power of a man to do. People can't do the things that Jesus did. They were many. His miracles were many. His miracles were public. His miracles were undeniable. The people that want to kill him never once say, you didn't do that. They cannot deny it. Arthur Pink says this, His miracles were of such a kind that they made any claim he made about himself a credible claim. If you've not yet put your hope in Jesus Christ, should you not give some thought to this today? Should you not think about what Jesus is saying when he says, Believe the works that you may know and understand the Father's in me and I am in the Father. Should you not think about this? Jesus says that if you will take an honest look at his works, you will know that he is God. If you will honestly evaluate the evidence, Jesus offers to reveal to you the truth about his identity today. In 1998, a man named Lee Strobel wrote a book called The Case for Christ. Many of you have probably read that. Lee was an atheist. He had a legal background. and He was an investigative journalist. And he and his wife moved into an apartment complex. And while he was at work one day, one of the neighbors came over with some cookies and gave them to his wife. And she was a Christian. A medieval Christian. And she began to talk with his wife about the claims of Jesus. And Lee's wife was saved. She became a Christian. 
And this made Lee very upset, very angry. And so he set out to prove that what his wife was now believing was just a hoax. And he turned all his legal background powers and all his investigative journalism powers on the claims of Christ to disprove it. And at the end of his investigation, here's what he said. He said, quote, it would require more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. I would have to swim upstream against this torrent of evidence pointing toward the truth of Jesus Christ, and I couldn't do that. So I received Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. He saw the works, and he saw the words, and it was undeniable to anybody who was actually seeking truth. Must we believe that Jesus is God in order to be saved? Absolutely. Because the Jesus who saves is God. Uh, several months back, we, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, the one that's Pentecostals. You know, there's millions of these people in America. Maybe some of you have got some background in one that's Pentecostalism. Uh, there's churches in Jackson County this morning. Uh, they're up there. They're praising Jesus. They're rah-rah. They're going wild. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible. It's the Jesus who is the Father, the Jesus who is Jesus, and the Jesus who is the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in the Trinity. There's Mormons that get fired up about Jesus. There's Jehovah's Witnesses that get fired up about Jesus. Wrong Jesus. You need to believe in the Jesus of Scripture, who is God, who is the second person of the Trinity. Or you cannot be saved because this is the God who saves. There are many who call themselves Christians who believe that Jesus was a great moral teacher, but they reject his claim to be God. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes this memorable quote that you've all heard. He says, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I and the Father are one. I am the Son of God, Jesus said of himself. But of course, if a person is determined that they will not believe something, there is no amount of evidence that will ever convince that person. Because at the end of the day, people believe this, what they want to believe. That's the case with the Jerusalem authorities. They have seen all of Jesus' mighty works, and they're unconvinced because they don't want to be convinced. Look at verse 40 and 42, which gives a different scene as Jesus leaves Jerusalem and goes back to the other side of Jordan. Verse 40. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. Now that's referring to John the Baptist. So uh, right now, Jesus' ministry is coming full circle. It started here at this place across the Jordan. Ten chapters later, we're back around to Jesus, going back to this place where his public ministry started in the Gospel of John. Uh, this is the end of the first main section of John's Gospel. His public ministry is over at this point. From, from here forward, he's going to the cross, okay? He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John the Baptist had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. Verse 41. And many came to him, and they said, John, that is John the Baptist, did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there, as opposed to in Jerusalem where many rejected him. Now, what is the difference between the Jerusalem authorities who want to stone Jesus for his claim to be God and those beyond the Jordan who willingly receive him as their Savior and Lord? What is the difference? Beyond the Jordan is where people have been exposed to the ministry of John the Baptist. And the ministry of John the Baptist convicted people of sin and of their need for a Savior. And what that did was humble them. And humble people are able to receive the truth. And so many believe in Jesus there beyond the Jordan. Whereas those in Jerusalem who want to stone him have never been humbled by the preaching of John the Baptist. And so when they were presented with Jesus' mighty words and works, their heart was as hard as a rock. And they kept him at arm's length. And they tried to kill him. 
Those in Jerusalem were a bunch of proud, self-righteous, know-it-alls. And they died in their sin. Pride will keep you from knowing the truth. If you think you know everything, you will know nothing. You will be unable to receive Christ for who he is. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to know the truth this morning? If in humility you will honestly look at the evidence, which is the power of God manifested in the works of Jesus, then Jesus promises that you will know the truth. Look at this in the end of verse 38. Believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus says, look at my works with a desire to know the truth and you will know who I am. I will reveal myself to you. The Gospel of Luke tells us that after John the Baptist was arrested, he sent two of his disciples to make sure that Jesus was who he had claimed to be. So uh, this would happen prior on the timeline of the Gospel. Earlier, John the Baptist had been arrested. He was in prison. He was waiting for his head to be cut off. And he had become discouraged and disillusioned because... Jesus, uh, he had believed in Jesus as the Messiah, and now uh, Jesus wasn't making all the wrongs right and punishing all his enemies and bringing in the kingdom like John the Baptist thought he would. And so John the Baptist sent two of his disciples to Jesus with this question. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, Luke 7, 21 says, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed his eyes. And he answered them, them being the people who had been sent by John the Baptist to inquire about Jesus' identity. Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, dead people are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them. In other words, go tell John the Baptist what you have seen me do, and he will know who I am. Perhaps you're listening today and have never come to Jesus Christ as your God and Savior. I want to challenge you to read through one of the Gospels this week. It takes you about one hour a day. Just read through one of the Gospels and ask yourself this in all sincerity. Does this have the ring of truth about it? Look at the works that Jesus does. These are miracles that only God can do. And while you're reading that gospel, remind yourself, this is eyewitness testimony. It's corroborated by this other eyewitness. It's corroborated by this other eyewitness. It's corroborated by this other eyewitness. And they all died for this. And if it was a lie, why would they die for it? Church in a world that constantly belittles our faith, makes us out to be fools, narrow-minded bigots, who believe in fairy tales, I want to remind you that what we believe is true. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, is God Almighty. He did things that no man can do. You are justified and you are well-founded in your faith in Christ. It doesn't matter what the TV tells you. It doesn't matter what the wonky history channel shows put on there where they dug up some book out of the dust, the Gospel of Mary or something. You are well-founded, well-grounded, in believing in Jesus. You are no fool. These things are true. He is God. And ultimately, he walked out of the grave alive after three days to prove it. And he is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Brothers and sisters, we can rejoice today in the truth that Jesus has given us eternal life. We will never perish. No one will snatch us out of his hand because to be in the hand of Jesus is to be in the hand of God. Amen? Father, we thank you that God became a man, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We're thankful that we don't have to believe in fairy tales. We don't have to trust in a philosopher, a sage of some kind, a great moral teacher. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, who showed us what you, O oh God, are like. Uh, thank you that God came and dwelt among us. And so, Lord, we want to be freshly impressed with the power and reality of these things. 
we believe, Christ, that what you say about yourself is true. We believe that you and the Father are one. Not one person, but of one essence. The same, in essence, equal in power and glory. And we rejoice that our souls are held in the hands of God and by the power of God because our souls are held by Jesus Christ. And so in the coming days and weeks, would you encourage us with these truths? Would you help us, Lord, to grow in faith and in reliance on the things that we've heard today? And I pray for those who do not know you, who do not believe that this Jesus of whom we've spoken this morning is the very one who in the beginning said, let there be light, and there was light. The one who uh, created this planet and the entire cosmos and who is coming again for those who trust in him, coming again to create a new heaven and a new earth. Now, Father, we praise you for your word and the chance we've met together this morning. We ask you to be with us now as we take communion. At this time, we're going to Come to the Lord's table and remember the love that Christ showed for us by dying in our place. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to bear the wrath of God for all who will trust in him. That's what we're celebrating. His body was broken for us, brothers and sisters. His blood was shed for us that we might live. We come to remember our union with him and not just with him, but with all who trust in him as Lord and Savior. These people who are coming to take this cup, this juice, and this bread with you, that's your real family. You need to think about that. We come to commit ourselves afresh to Jesus as our Lord and as our God. And we come to feed spiritually on Jesus who is the bread of life. To draw strength and hope and joy from our union with him. And so as we take communion, we want to celebrate the fact that our sins have been forgiven on account of his name. This is a sacred time at the Lord's table, and it is for baptized believers. If you are not a baptized believer, do not come down here and take this bread and this cup. Because the Bible says that if you do that, you eat and drink damnation to yourselves. If you are not a baptized believer, do not touch communion. Wait until you come to faith, and then you can partake with us. Now, communion is for saved sinners. If you're a saved sinner who's been baptized, made a profession of faith, this table is for you. But if you are living in unrepentant sin, in outright defiance of Christ's command, refrain until you can come freely to partake. After you receive the elements, take them back to your seat and hold them, and we will partake of them together. And as Ivy begins to play, just feel free to go and get the elements there at different corners throughout the room.
tape under there, and then you cut off the bottom part, and the juice is under the bottom seal. Uh, I will try to give you more time to, to, to peel it open this morning. I just told him last week, he said, Dad, you still left me open so fast, I didn't even get mine open. But uh, I'll try to give you a little more time. Uh, so go ahead and, and, and get the wafer, please. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now you peel off that next layer there. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Isaiah 40, verse 9 through 11 says this. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, Herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are his young. Go in the care and the providence and the power of Christ, your heavenly judgment. Mm -hmm. 